Hi again, I want to talk to you today about how great God's love for you is. How great God's love for you is. I was going to entitle this, How Great God's Love Is For Us, but I, I sense that that's not really personal enough. You know, the truth is God loves you, and it's, it's about you. His love for you is so beyond your imagination. I mean, we, we as human beings don't understand how great his love is. It's just so beyond us. And I'm going to make that the subject of this message today. It's just how great God's love is for you. You who is listening to this video, how great his love is for you. Let's start with 1 John 3, 1. It says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So notice that we are the children of God, and that's an expression of how great God's love is for us. And to the Father, He didn't just give us love. He lavished. He lavished love on us. God loves us so much. He lavished His love on us. And how great is His love for us? That we should be called children of God. He's our Father. He's our Father. Our Father's love for His children is the love that the Father has for us. That's how great His love is for us, that we are called the children of God. Because it says that's what we are. We are the children of God. And God expressed His love to us in so many ways. But of course, the greatest way is expressed for us in John chapter 13, where it says in verse 1, It was just before the Passover feast, and Jesus knew that the time had come for Him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. And this is talking about what Jesus was about to do. He's about to go to the cross and take up the sins of the world. And he loved his disciples and he loved all those who were in the world. And now he was going to show them the full extent of his love. And that was by going to the cross and taking up all their sins, even though we didn't deserve it. None of us deserved it when Jesus took up our sins. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, we did nothing to deserve it. We were yet sinners. We did nothing to deserve God's love. But God commended his love in us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we look up at verse 5 above that, it says, And hope makes us not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which he has given to us. So not only did God show us his love by sending Jesus while we were yet sinners, but he also shed abroad in our hearts his love, the love of God, is shed abroad in our hearts. The love of God. That's agape, the love of God. It is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who he's given to us. So not only did God love us, but he also put his love in us. He shed his love abroad in our hearts, in our hearts, in us. And then, of course, if we go to 1 John chapter 4, we have the definitive a chapter on love here. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. That's the origination of love. Love comes from God. He's the originator of love. The devil is the originator of hatred. The devil is the originator of killing and death and destruction. God is the originator of love. Love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Just like it just told us in Romans, he has shed abroad his love in our hearts. He's already done it. He put it in our hearts through his Holy Spirit, which he gave to us. And so everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Why is that? The new creation we have, it is in God's nature. It has love in it. We have the love of God shed abroad in us when we're born again. So everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. That's because God is the originator of love. For love comes from God. 
And the very next verse says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is agape. The God kind of love is agape. God is love. And that love, of course, is defined for us in 1 Corinthians 13. But verse 9 tells us that in this was manifested the love of God towards us. This is how God's love was shown towards us. It was manifested because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. And that's why Jesus said there in John 13 that now he's going to show the fullness of God's love. By what was he going to do? He's going to go to the cross and take the sins of the world. Give us the ability to be born again and have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And that's the manifestation. And this was manifested, the love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten son. Now, we're children of God, too, but we're born into the family. We're adopted into the family and born into it by being born again. But the only begotten son of God is Jesus Christ. And God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's the manifestation of God's love towards us. And this is love. Not that we loved God, verse 10, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So here we see what love is. We see that he manifested his love by sending his only begotten son that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. Because that's what love is. Love is about other people, caring about other people, putting other people before yourself. And that God is the perfect example of that. He loved us when we didn't deserve it. When we were yet sinners, God sent Jesus for us. And that is love. Here is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins before we ever deserved it. We never can deserve it. But we didn't deserve it when he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So verse 11 so if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is perfected in us. And this is one way of saying you, you want to show God to people. No man has seen God at any time, but you want to show God to people. Love one another for God dwells in us. Remember what happens when we get born again, God sheds his, his love abroad in our hearts, and that is done by the Holy Spirit. God dwells in us by his Holy Spirit. If we love one another, God, by his Holy Spirit, dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. His love is shed abroad in our hearts. And hereby we know that we do dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his Spirit. That's how God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. And that brings us back to the Gospel of John, chapter 15, where Jesus told us in John chapter 15, verse 10, If you keep my commandments, you, should, you abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So here Jesus says that he abides in God the Father's love. Jesus is the Son of God, the only begotten Son of God. We are um, also children of God by adoption, but we are God's children also. How great is his love that he has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. But Jesus was God the Father's only begotten Son. And he said, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love, so we should keep his commandments and abide in his love. How do we abide in his love? By keeping his commandments. Well, what are his commandments? People say, oh, that's the Ten Commandments. No, it isn't. No, the Bible says, this is John writing this. And he knew what the commandments of Jesus were. He knew what they were. He wrote those in his epistle. In 1 John chapter 3, he told us exactly what God's commandments are, what Jesus' commandments are. Verse 23, this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and what? Love one another as he gave us commandment. This is the commandment of Jesus. Jesus said, love one another. And John reminds us of this. He says, this is the commandment. This is the commandment of God, that you should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, 
and love one another as he gave us commandment. Jesus gave commandment that we should love one another. Why is that? That's a reflection of God's very nature. God is love. Remember 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, told us God is love, and that word love is agape. And that's defined for us in 1 Corinthians 13. tells us what that love is. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4, agape, talking about agape, the love of God. Love, agape, is patient. It's kind. That means God is patient and God is kind. So, of course, he wants us to be patient and be kind because we're supposed to love one another as God loved us. How did he love us? He was patient with us and he's kind to us. We should be patient and kind to one another. Love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. That's the love of God. So God isn't envious and he does not boast and God's not proud. God is not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered and he keeps no record of wrongs because all this is talking about agape, the love of God and God is love. So love is patient and kind. It does not envy. It's not boast. It does not boast. It's not proud. Love is not rude. It's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. All this is how God is because that's what love is. God is love. And therefore, we have this love in us because that love was shed abroad in our hearts. So we have this love in us that allows us to not be rude, to not be self-seeking, to not be easily angered, and to keep no record of wrongs. So we're not supposed to keep a record of wrongs, just like God doesn't keep a record of our wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. That's why we do not delight in evil, and we rejoice in the truth. Love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That means God always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres, which that love is shed abroad in our hearts, which means we can always protect, always trust, always hope, and always persevere. Love, the love of God, never fails. So God's love, the love of God, agape, it never fails. Even in the Old Testament, we see God's love shown to the Israelites. In Isaiah chapter 63, and starting at verse 7, we see an Old Testament, Old Testament example of God's love. It says, I will tell of the kindness of the Lord. The kindness. Love is patient and kind. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for the house of Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. God's compassion and his many kindnesses. In verse 8, he said, Surely they are my people, sons who will not be false to me. And so he became their savior. He saved them out of their troubles. He saved them out of their troubles. In all their distresses, he too was distressed. He cared. God cared about everything that happened to these, the house of Israel, the Israelites. In all their distress, he was distressed too. He felt it. And the angel of the Lord of his presence, it saved them. God sent his angel and saved them. He became their savior. He saved them out of their troubles. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. And he lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. God lifted up and carried the house of Israel in all the days of old. Yes, the people of Israel, they fell away and they didn't have the perfect love of God in them. They weren't born again yet, so they didn't have the love of God and the nature of God in them yet. So yes, they fell short. But God's love was still expressed to them as an example. And now in these New Testament times, we have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts so that we can love everyone else. We can show the love of God to people. And that's why it tells us the prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, there's such a powerful prayer here. And this is a prayer that Paul prayed. He said, in, starting at verse 14, For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and earth derives its name. So he's praying to God the Father. And he says, I pray out of his glorious riches that God may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so his Holy Spirit is in your inner being and God can strengthen you by his spirit, through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts 
through faith. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love. So he's praying for believers and he says that they are rooted and established in love. Why is that? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. We're born again, children of God. We have the love of God shed abroad in our hearts. And so Paul says, I pray that you, the believers in Ephesus, you being rooted and established in love, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Paul's praying that the, the believers in Ephesus may, may have power together with all the saints to grasp, to understand how wide and long and high and deep God's love is, the love of Christ wherein Jesus gave his life for us. God sent his son before we ever deserved it to take all our sins. And, and Paul is praying here that we would have power to grasp, to understand how wide and long and high and deep God's love is. To know this love. Paul's praying that we would know this love that surpasses knowledge. So the love of God for us surpasses knowledge. It's beyond our understanding. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, it's absolutely beyond our understanding, the love that God has shed abroad in our hearts. And here Paul is praying that we would have power to grasp that love, to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In other words, how are you filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? by knowing that love that surpasses knowledge. That's why Paul prayed this prayer. He wanted the people to understand how much God loves them. Love is not that we loved him, but that he loved us. And his love for us makes us love him back. He sheds abroad his love in our hearts and that love just is aching to come out of us. We have that love in us and we wanna share it with the world now because it's God's love for the world that we're showing. So Paul prayed that we would know that love which surpasses knowledge because that will allow us to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So the love of God for us is so important. It's so, so, so important. And Paul knew this. And so he prayed for the Ephesians, for the believers in Ephesus. He prayed for them to understand, to know that love which surpasses knowledge. It's beyond our understanding. Why did he want them to know that love which surpasses knowledge? That they may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Did you ever want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God? I do. I, I'm not ashamed to admit I want to be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How's that going to happen? By understanding his love, by just getting a grasp. We get a tiny grasp of how, how high and wide and long and deep his love is for us. And that just absolutely shakes us to the core of our being, that love, because it's beyond our knowledge. It's beyond our understanding. It's beyond anything we can comprehend. It's love that's so great. It's the agape, the love of God. It's love that is patient and kind, love that keeps no record of wrongs. That's the love God has for us. And it's the most important thing in this world. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 13, And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Why is that? Because God is love. Love is the expression of God. It's the expression of God. And God has shed his love abroad in our hearts when we got born again by his spirit that dwells in us. His Holy Spirit living in us is an example of his love towards us and a reminder at all times of God's love for us. How great is the love God has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And by becoming children, he put his, his Holy Spirit inside of us and he made us born again new creations in Christ Jesus. And we renew our minds with the knowledge of how great his love is for us. We renew our minds with the word of God. We receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls or renew our minds. And it, what is that for? To help us understand how great God's love is for us. So we can express that love to the people around us, show people how much God loves them, because that's what really matters. We're going to go through things in this world. There'll be troubles that'll come upon us. There'll be hardships. There'll be trials. But God's love, it shines through all of it. And God's love can be expressed in the midst of all of it. And God's love is the most powerful force in this world. 
It was God's love that made him send Jesus to be the propitiation for our sins. He took the sins of the world when we did not deserve it. Of course, we still don't deserve it. We never will deserve it. But God's love for us is so great. He looked past that and he loved us perfectly beyond what we deserve. So that's my message for today. Thanks for watching.